Hello, uh, it's John Rob here interviewing Tony James about the ZZ Sputnik Hi, John. experience. Yeah, hello, Tony. So, um, the first thing I want to ask you really is for me, all great rock and roll bands are born of concepts. It's not just it's not just a bedraggled bunch of people bumbling into each other. It's a concept. And you were, after Generation X, you were searching for the concept that will become ZZ Sputnik. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I knew after Generation X, and obviously I'd, I'd learned so much from Malcolm McLaren and Bernie Rhodes, having worked with those people. Um, I knew I needed some new grand scheme. You know, I did mess around. I tried to form a group with Steve Baters and Brian James, the sort of the early lords of the new church. But it felt like I was retreading something I'd already done. So I kind of sat in a cafe in the middle of Mayfair on my own for about six months, reading books and thinking up the grand scheme and writing in my notebook. And I knew I wanted to do something that would be ultimately my dream group to be in. You know, I wanted to combine T-Rex. I wanted to combine Donna Summer's electronic rhythm section. I wanted to put the whole thing in dub. I wanted it to be futuristic, but at the heart of it, I wanted it to be a rock and roll band with two drummers as well, like the Pink Fairies that I loved when I was younger. You know, so um, it took a long while to kind of conceive the idea. Yeah, I mean, what I've always been interested about what you do in your role and things is you, you see, in, and there's a few people like this in the punk sort of era, that the person in the band was almost actually the manager of the band, the conceptualist. And I, I was thinking back maybe to 1975 and you sat there at Parade Street with, with Mick Jones and you're just waiting for people to turn up in, in yeah. that, um, underneath yeah. what is now the Chinese restaurant. And yeah. even then, it's the concept, isn't it? They had to look right. Even if they were the best musician in the world, if they had the wrong hair, they weren't in. Um, yeah, is, I mean, is that, yeah. I mean, maybe that's, it's a confusing thing because look right, it's, it's you look beyond the look. You know, people have a certain charisma and attitude and a look. And if they're the right person, they tend to have that all those attributes. So you're looking for much more than the right jacket and the right haircut and the right face. But it's all of these things. It's charisma and all. So it's very difficult to find people. But when you meet the right people, you get this feeling this could be the one. You know, so, I mean, I've had it when I'd met Billy back in the day, when I first met Mick Jones back in the day, we immediately had a kind of a bond, you know, um, and, uh, but it takes time. And, but what you need to do is you need to put yourself in the right environment to find those people, you know, and that's a combination of a load of things. Adverts in the music papers, which often don't find anyone or, walking the streets, going to hip hairdressers, going to hip clothing stores in the King's Road or Kensington Market, all those places. It's as if the universe says you have to really put the work in if you're going to find these great people. We went, when you talk about, um, you, you do stuff with Steve Baters and Brian James, the wonderful Brian James, it actually goes back to the uh, London SS period as well, the, uh, the legendary demo tape, which you've still got, but won't <laughs> <everybody. laughs> yeah. Well, but you, yeah. you kind of knew you didn't want to go back to rock and roll or, or, or to a, an older version of rock and roll. Because yeah. was this because you believe that rock and roll has to be off the moment and it has to be forward and future thinking? Um, for me, I wanted to do something futuristic. You know, I always say that I, I wanted to imagine if I walked into a club in 100 years time and the new Elvis was playing in that club, what would he sound like? You know, and that's the kind of thing you're trying to think yourself into. Obviously, it's a grand scheme and it's, uh, and, you know, it would not be fair to suggest it was all me. You know, these, these were not five puppets that I found to be in the group. People with, who are charismatic and who have a certain attitude bring something else to the party as well. You know, some members of the group bring a gun, unfortunately, but, um, you know, <laughs> generally uh, they bring something else and uh, that all adds to the uh, ultimate group. But it, what you need to be able to do is put those people in a fertile mix of listening to the right music, of listening to the right movies, um, 
you know, going to the right places, hanging out in the right places. You know, Sputnik spent more time hanging out in amusement arcades in Soho and King's Cross than we did rehearsing to start with. It was as if we needed to immerse ourselves in this futuristic world that we wanted to be. And also become a gang, which is another yeah. important tenant. Yeah, of rock absolutely. And roll. <laughs> absolutely. Just hanging out at 3 a.m., walking around King's Cross, stopping and getting a coffee in some little cafe that's open all night. It kind of makes a bonding of the group. And playing all those early video games in those arcades allowed us to enter the Blade Runner world that I was trying to get the group into. How much of a Bernard? Bernard how, <laughs> how, how much of a Bernard Rhodes uh, mythology is in here? Because I remember you telling me when you first met him, he gave you a book list, a record list, and uh, twenty quid. <laughs> well, Bernie was a great conceptualist, and and he certainly taught me a massive amount. You know that he um, quite rightly said, you know, have you read Sartre? Have you read all these different books? And I went, no. And he went, well, you better get down the library. And he gave me a reading list. And I did dutifully go to the library and read all the books that he said. And what was so great, see, look, me and Decker, um, what was so brilliant about what Bernie did, he never told us what to think. But again, he put us in the right primordial door soup that allowed us to come up with it ourselves. You know, and it was a very clever thing. And I learned so much from Bernie. Now, not that I gave the members of Zig Zig Sputnik reading lists, you know, but we more watched the right kind of videos. And we were in an era of getting pirate videos at that time, you know, um, of Clockwork Orange and Blade Runner. And we used to have um, Pink Flamingos and the John Waters films. And we used to have those on rotation on the TV set, you know, while we were just sitting around discussing what we were going to do. Again, so, uh, yeah. You know, I learned a lot from those guys. Again, like London SS, the TV on in the corner of the rehearsal room, <laughs> the sound turned down. And it's, but it's, but we're now we're entering, uh, coming out of punk into post punk. It's a much more multimedia age, which um, maybe, maybe Stip Bates and Brian James are mean, both wonderful, you know, players and musicians, but they're, they're more of the old rock and roll. And you're looking at this multimedia age and incorporating it into what ZZ Sputnik will become. And I'm yeah. trying to think of you here, sat there in the cafe in Mayfair, and, and you talk about in the, uh, the notes that come with the box set, uh, writing, you, you, you sit there with a little book and you're writing little ideas down. So what, what, kind, what kind of ideas are you write down that period? Well, you know, when I was sitting in, I, it was one of those strange moments. I got, I walked from, I was living with Magenta at the time in Maidervale. I walked into, I thought, Mayfair would be an interesting area. I walked to Shepherd's Market, that was a kind of a little community. And there was this cafe there that had a basement. And I thought, this, is, this could be it. This could be our Two Eyes coffee bar, you know? So I went to this ridiculous cafe virtually every other day, sat in the basement of the cafe, reading books and writing notes. And I was reading a lot of um, Colin Wilson books at the time, which is, he was mainly an occult writer, but what he, what I got from that was that if you believe in it enough, you can make it happen. Sounds all very woo woo, but it was very much like I had to believe I could make this happen, you know, because I'm sitting there nursing a cup of coffee back on the doll, you know, um, for weeks and weeks and weeks. Billy's in America, um, you know, being really brilliant. You know, uh, there was a moment where he he turned up at the Muse House one day and he said, oh, I bought a white la label of um, my new record. I thought you might, and I hadn't seen it for a couple of years. Uh, I thought you might want to hear it. And he, he put on the stereo White Wedding. And I thought, shit, it's so great. <laughs> I'm so going to have to go some here. You know, <laughs> so, the time you as well. so I'm sitting in this cafe writing notes of perspective group ideas what it could may be all the various things but remember at the fundamental heart of it the first things that we did was that we played pure rock and roll 50s rock and roll we went back to gene vincent eddie cochran elvis played those songs with our two drummer and guitarist singer dub lineup you know so that the heart of the group was rock and roll 
that is that because you have to find the spirit of it, the the actual kernel of it, what it actually was that that did make those massive revolutionary changes in that period. Yeah, well, I mean, obviously, that apart from Neil, the other people had never played before, so we were very much playing the most simplest thing with the two drummers playing the simplest beat they could possibly do. On on, and the remarkable thing is we're we're sitting in the house that once. Um, belong to Sid Vicious in the room that Sid Vicious slept in with two drum kits, one given to us by Topper Hedden and one given to us by Terry Chimes. So it has this fantastic history and magic about it of where we're teaching these people to play Eddie Cochran songs and Gene Vincent songs. And there was somehow a magic in the air, you know, and I've still got recordings of those initial rehearsals which sound diabolical but you know um <laughs> it had something so, so it's more about teaching sounds people great band. Well, <laughs> <laughs> so it's more about teaching the newcomers uh what, what the core of rock and roll is what what yeah, that spirit yeah. is yeah yeah because it's it's like with any other discipline you have to go right back to first principles to understand that very simple elements of what made it great and how key was uh, Magenta in this? I mean, I, I, I imagine you were thick as these at that time. She was also very, a, a brilliant conceptualist. So I imagine the well, ideas yeah. between you were bouncing. Absolutely. I mean, Magenta was my girlfriend at the time. We were living in this Muse house that she bought from Malcolm after Sid died. Um, the endless hours Magenta and I lay awake at night um, going over and over. How are we going to do this? Have we made the right decision? Is Martin the right singer? He can't sing. It sounds like this diabolical, you know, you go through such trauma. I mean, we're talking three or four years in the concept of this. This is not a few weeks. You know, Generation X, we put together in four weeks, found the people, went, oh, you know, I met Billy, go, oh, you'll be, you'll be great, let you be the singer. And then Billy said, oh, I've seen this guitarist. Oh, great, he looks like Jeff Beck, let's get him. You know, it was all so simple. But to do it the second time around when you know so much and you know so much that can go wrong, it's incredibly difficult. So it, it was years of the trauma. Magenta had, was, was totally my total muse and my touchstone for everything. Hmm. And but, how much of it? And how much of a touchstone was Mick? Because Mick's still involved here and you were best buddies from London SS through the Clash period as well. Mick was fantastic. He was still playing with the Clash at that stage. Um, he totally got what I wanted to do. And, I, you know, I can remember going round to his house one day and saying, look, you know, uh, I don't know, Martin just sounds terrible. Or, you know, maybe we should get rid of him. It's, uh, it's too long a journey. You know, and Mick went, no, no, it's going to be great. He's got something, you know, and the guitarist, it's going to be great. So often if I would become weak and think I can't deal with this or am I making a huge mistake, um, he was there very solid in the background. He was also the one that phoned me one day and he was in um, the States and said, oh, I've seen this funny looking guitar. It like makes a synthesizer noise. Um, I'll get you one. I'll bring it back. And he brought it back from the Clash tour in America and, br and brought it around and gave it to me. Um, and that was how we got to have the bass playing that electronic sound. Because up until that stage, I was still playing a regular bass guitar rather than electric, even though we were demoing the tracks with a synthesizer and drum machine. When we were playing live, I was playing with a regular bass. So that, again, the Clash were incredibly um, supportive and instrumental in the creation of Zig Zig Sputnik. We all used to play football every Wednesday night. Ludicrous though that sounds. <laughs> Sputnik <laughs> versus Flash on a Wednesday night down the local park in Labrock Grove. <laughs> so who, who won the games then? Was it Zig Zig Sputnik or the Clash? But surprisingly, Degville was quite a nifty attacking player. <laughs> 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 so the first member to join was Neil X. So how did you find Neil? Neil, I actually did find through an advert. Um, remarkably, he, you know, I put an advert saying wanted guitarist into Johnny Thunder's T-Rex, the usual kind of stuff. Um, and Neil came over and he just had a freshness and a youthful enthusiasm 
you know, it would have been easy for me to have got ex-punk rock stars that I already knew or get someone in, but they wouldn't have had that freshness about them. And I needed that as well. I needed someone to make me feel fresh and I was doing something new. I mean, it was such heady days, John, you know, mm. to start something and feel you have this magical thing that you're creating that nobody knows about. Mm. You know, so Neil turns up and he lives out in the countryside and he's working as a dustman um, and he comes up and he rents like a bed sit in and he's on the dole and you know and he's or he stays in the spare bedroom at magenta's and suddenly we're two you know mm. and we spent nearly a year walking the streets of london <laughs> thinking we're just gonna like see someone i mean it when i look back at it it seems ludicrous that we thought we could do it that way you know, but that's no different from Malcolm having the shop and, you know, John Lydon walks in. So, you know, we, were, we, went, we went to Richmond. We spent a lot of time in Richmond because that's where the Stones started, the Station Hotel. And we thought that's going to be magical ground. Maybe we'll see someone there. We went to Ealing, you know, where other clubs were in the 60s. So we went to all these different places, just literally walking the streets. And it wasn't until we were out one Saturday afternoon and Magenta was with us. And we were walking around Kensington Market. We walk in and we see this freaky looking guy dancing to music in a, his own shop. And Magenta went, here's our guy. And we just went, oh my God. <laughs> you know, who knows what we let ourselves into. <laughs> <laughs> and what, what, was, what was the initial work relationship like with, with Martin? He was the sweetest, most enthusiastic person. And uh, he lived in Birmingham still, you know, he was sharing a, a flat with Boy George at the time. And, you know, he used to come up, meet me on a, this is going to take forever, John, you know this, the whole story is, <laughs> is a big story. Um, we, I used to go and meet him at Euston Station on a Friday night where he'd get off the train. And it was easy to find him because everyone in Euston Station was looking in his direction. <laughs> and this freak had just got off the train. And we used to spend a long weekend practicing or playing in magenta uh, at the house, you know, often miming to other people's tracks, just like being a group, but miming yeah. the <laughs> almost, you know. Um, so when so you talk, when, when we, we talk, yeah, when we talk initially, now, you know, I mean, obviously you brought the concept in the first place, but the other guys brought so much in as well. What, what, were Neil and Martin, what were Neil and Martin bringing in to the pot? I mean, Neil brought music, Martin brought tunes, Martin brought a fantastic image, and he was the one who created the, or curated the whole image of the group. You know, because already it was perfect, doesn't it? He has a clothes shop, just like Malcolm had sex. Suddenly we've got Yaya, and, you know, it's suddenly we've got our own version of sex in Kensington Market. So Martin's shop becomes our base, you know, so we can create the demos at Magenta's, you know, in the front room on a little porter studio, and then we can play them in the shop. You know, we can make t-shirts for the group. We're selling t-shirts of the group before we've even written a song, you know? Um, it's, it's an extraordinary thing, you know, it was brilliant. Billy Idol's group came in the shop one uh, day and, brought a load of Zig Zig Sputnik t-shirts. Unbeknownst, it was even a group. And I thought, <laughs> how great, I'm already infiltrating Billy's group. <laughs> even the name was a stroke of genius, it's fantastic. Well, and, and again, we'd, we'd looked at so many names. Um, you know, Martin had suggested Sperm Festival, <laughs> which wouldn't have gone <laughs> that well. We looked at, we were talking about the Whores of Babylon, which was from my Colin Wilson days, um, you know, all different freaky names, but none of them just felt right. You know, I didn't want to have that drugs overtone or occult overtone or any negative. I wanted something futuristic. Now, we were friends with Fachner O'Kelly, who was a really nice guy who I've become friends with. And um, he called me up one day and said, I've just, I've got a, article I ripped out the Herald Tribune. Um, I was flying back from the States. He was managing the Boomtown Rats at the time. And I went over to his, his house and he showed me this bit he torn out of the newspaper from the Herald Tribune. And it was a story about 
uh, a street gang in Moscow that were a kind of Fagin-esque street gang that sort of ran dollar broking and petty crimes and stuff like that. And it just was perfect, you know. And of course, that line named after a Moscow street gang was the opening line of every article the group ever did because the name has this perfect story. And of course, in those days, the uh, mid 80s, it seemed very exotic, Moscow and the hammer and sickle and the idea of Russians and street gangs, you know. And because it was Sputnik, man's first object in space, it was just perfect. And suddenly it all came together. Mm -hmm. And, and musically, it come together at this point as well. I mean, you, you, you said initially you were playing that old rock and roll to get the feel. Yes. But, uh, a couple of years before Billy had brought in, Billy, Billy Idol had brought in um, a suicide record, and you've both been playing yes. that a lot. And that, that's a very key part of the sound, the, the futuristic yes. rock and roll of suicide. No question, no question. And especially, actually, Alan Vega's solo records. Um, because... The three of us, me, Martin and Neil, went to see Alan Vega at the um, venue in um, Victoria when he had his first record, Jukebox Baby. And that really, and what he was doing was he was playing Suicide, but so stripped back with just guitar, bass and drums and him and no drum feels, nothing. All, it was so fundamental and exactly it was the, the place that we were looking for. And that was massively influential. Had, ad has been Frankie Teardrop, which have been on the stereo non-stop when we were playing. And, and you can see so many of the early Sputnik demos were so mutated versions of early suicide tracks. Rocket USA became Rocket Miss USA, where we put a chorus in and rewrote the verse, you know. So they were massive. That was a massively influential music for Sputnik. Interesting now, because suicide had become a huge influence for lots of people back at the time. Lee Springsteen. They're, they're tiny. Dream, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. How great <laughs> One that? of his favourite groups, apparently. Which, yeah. But then, when, when, when you were playing around with a suicide influence, they were super cult, weren't they? Most people just didn't really get them, did they then? No. Well, I, I'd seen them because Mick cleverly got them on the Clash tour and they were bottled off most nights. Um, but so I'd seen them up close, you know, and just loved this idea of here was this sort of, you know, Elvis, New Yorker, you know, playing and this raging torrent of synthesizers. So it was such a huge influence to us and it was so refreshing and there was nothing else around like it. It was really only Suicide and the Cramps were the other big influence with their stripped black mm. back, really. Yeah, and the, yeah, and, and, and the stylish in the Cramps, especially initially Brian Gregory and yeah, and he, you know, he had the high heels and yeah, Brian Gregory looked like the epitome of the perfect rock and roll risen from the dead guitarist. Mm. But obviously so you, we you were- can't mining, this, you, yeah. We were mining a different scene in that we were looking absolutely to the future, to Clockwork Orange and Blade Runner um, and science fiction films. And, and, and especially the John Carpenter films like Escape from New York and Mad Max as well. You know, they were yeah. massive influence on us, you know. And uh, I remember there was a fantastic uh, picture of Mad Max that someone printed in NME once of Mad Max and the Thunderdomes. And it said, ladies and gentlemen, I give you Zig Zig Sputnik, you know. So it <laughs> went back around, you know. I mean, these weren't just uh, visual influences. These were actually musical influences to films as well, weren't John they? John Carpenter's music, Escape, you know, Assault on Precinct 13, again, never off the stereo. Mm. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> <laughs> would it be fair to say you, you're even in a way playing musically playing what you could see in the films definitely definitely mm. and of course Sputnik began to be conceived as a film rather than just a group you know though even when we were rehearsing we had pirate videos of these uh, movies playing endlessly on loops I had a cassette machine, uh, a video recorder cassette machine in the living room with a blank tape permanently in it on pause and record. And anything, any news story that was about, that was futuristic or any story about video arcades or anything like that, I immediately recorded those 
for use later on. And it, it was something I was just doing because I was saying, well, look, this is what we should be about. So I could play these endless tapes. But what I realized later on when I had, I must have had 20 or 30 three hour tapes of snippets from television shows. I, I realized I had this gold mine of samples of bits of voices, you know, because we hadn't incorporated the voices in the music yet. I know we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves on the, you know, creation of the group. Um, I love the guy smoking behind me. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> and, uh, and then somehow, you get, a ma you get a massive record deal, obviously not as big as you were telling everybody, but it's still a pretty <laughs> big record deal. I mean, were you quite surprised that the, the, you know, the majors actually embraced this? You know, as it went on, you know, and obviously we've skipped over meeting the drummers, but, you know, we talked about rehearsing them. Um, we had, we'd got three demo tracks um, that we'd put together and we would put together loads and loads of tracks and it hadn't really come together. And I was sort of getting quite distraught thinking, oh, none of these are quite right. We had the titles, Love Missile F111. We had all these brilliant titles, but the songs weren't really coming up with it. You know, um, I flew over to Los Angeles to go and see The Clash and hang out with Mick for a bit. They were playing with The Who at, uh, in, in LA. And I said to Martin, look, you stay in the flat. We've got the Porter Studio and the Pro One and the drum machine, you know, I'll, I'll be back in two weeks. You need to come up with something um, or this is just not happening. So I went mm -hmm. off to America and I came back two weeks later and all proudly they played me these three simple demos all at the same speed, <laughs> all with the same bass line virtually. Um, but they just sounded great. And suddenly all the ideas that we put into the songs all came together and suddenly we had a demo. But the, the master stroke was when I was playing the demos through the television and watching, because I, I, I was thinking maybe I could make a video, you know, that would illustrate the song and put a video together of all the movies that we, bits of movies that had influenced the band. So I, I plugged the little cassette player through the Radio Rentals rented video cassette recorder and I was playing these videos behind it and you could cut the soundtrack out of the videos. There was a switch and I could dub over the sound of our demo onto all it, onto these um, movie tracks. But there was this special switch on this new machine I had and you could click it and it merged the sound of the movie with the sound of the song that I was playing in. So suddenly I went, wow. So when Dirty Harry goes, go ahead, make my day, you can hear it on the record and, of, and or Clockwork Orange going ultra violence. And what that brings into the music is all the visual elements of those amazing films. It, you know, it, when you hear Malcolm McDowell going, you know, ultra violence, ultra violence, it conjures up this incredible image and it makes the record incredibly powerful. So we made this one video with all bits of Escape from New York and Assault on Precinct 13 and Clockwork Orange and all bits I got off the television of explosions and, you know, so when it's going shoot it up and go all these big explosions and bits from John Waters films and bits from Martin's porn collection, you know, all this stuff into this video. So we had this one track that was a video and I thought, you know, what we should do I'm not going to send cassettes off and be one of those sad, lonely cassettes sitting on the A&R man's shelf in, with other 200 cassettes people have sent in. Let's go in and play them a video when we go in. But of course, first thing we needed to do was get them all to phone us. Because, you know, if, I'm, if you're on the back foot, if you're phoning up going, can I bring in my video, they're going to think you're nuts and they've never heard of you. So we'd started to play gigs by then and Magenta was brilliant at getting the right kind of press. You know, um, there was the most fantastic piece in the face before the group had been anywhere or played anywhere, um, written by Paul Tickell, which almost was as if I'd written it myself. It was so <laughs> perfectly encapsulated what the group was about. And we had a genius photograph taken by Derek Richards of the group in this kind of futuristic walkway. And it exactly looked like straight out of Escape from New York. 
you know, and that piece um, came out and we, we booked to play at the um, screen uh, electric cinema in Portobello Road. Again, on our manor, we could walk to it. Um, it seemed the right place. And we had the film Maitress with Gerard Depper do uh, as the support act. And we played that night. And that afternoon, 14 major record companies phoned Magenta saying, can we come to see the group? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was, and, and we went, yeah, well, they would do, wouldn't they? You know, we had some <laughs> supreme confidence then because you felt like you had this greatest magic group in the world and you couldn't wait for everyone to see it. And so all these record companies came and they all, the next week, they all said, please come in and see us. And, you know, so I had this great trick. I would go in, I would play the one track and the video, you know, which had all these very freaky X-rated scenes in that, um, Lots of the record companies absolutely hated it, but lots of them loved it. And that's all they got. And we never left a demo tape. They never had a demo of any, anything of the group. They got to see the, the video for five minutes. Because you know what it's like. It's like when you meet a girl for the first time. When you go away, you imagine she's much more exciting and sexy and interesting <laughs> when you can't have her, you know? <laughs> so that's what we did with the record industry. And, yeah, we got offered the most genius deal. I mean, I'm making this sound like, you know, it's convoluted time scale. It's much longer than that, obviously. But, um, and there were other elements. We had the perfect lawyer, who was the Clash's lawyer, Transvision Vamp's lawyer. You know, he was my guy who could go in and ask for obscene amounts of money. So we did get an obscene amount of money. Yeah, not I as, mean, uh, not as much as you said, which was a great story on its own. Well, well again, it, it became a great story because we did... You know, we, we did an article for the Sunday Times magazine. You know, this is before a group's got a record deal. You know, just <laughs> doing the first record deal that Chris Salovich did, who I'd known from punk days, you know. And he said, oh, he sort of exaggerated the figure into f four million pounds, you know. And I love the figure four million pounds because at the time that was six million dollars. And it was like, it was another perfect headline, the six million dollars. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? He absolutely will not stop. And so then, it's just yeah. the serendipity of all these moments when it's right, the universe just sort of everything clicks into place. And the next master stroke was getting uh, Giorgio Moroder in to produce it, which yes. took it off in a, another direction, you know, with, with that. I mean, obviously, because I mean, Donna Summer 76 won the records of the year, another futuristic thinker, really musically, wasn't he? Totally, totally. I mean, when we wrote a list of who we wanted to produce us in our dreams, you know, mm. we said we could get John Carpenter, we could get Giorgio Moroder, we get David Bowie or Prince, you know. And we met Prince at the um, Embassy Club one night. There was one fantastic night. I don't, I don't think we played there, but we used to hang out there looking for freaky with all the coloured hair and everything. And we had a whole scene there. And one night Prince was there. And funnily enough, the girl from... Um, uh, the Thunderdome movie, you know, or the second Mad Max movie. It was one of those auspicious nights. And um, you know, when we want people. It came back that Prince thought it was too, too violent, um, which it was. Um, you know, Bowie, I forget what happened there. Um, but Moroder called back right away. And, you know, we were massive fans of Moroder, not only because of Donna Summer, which was our perfect rhythm track, the 12 inch mix of I Feel Love, again, on the stereo nonstop. Um, he was our perfect rhythm guy, but also because he came from film. You know, again, another track, the Scarface soundtrack or the Midnight Express soundtrack, never off the stereo while we were rehearsing. So we flew out to Munich where he had a studio, took the demo tape, you know, or demo video, played in the video, that's all he saw, the one track, and he just totally got it, he totally understood it, you know, and um, for his huge fee, he was happy to fly to London. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did a great job. Yeah. Magical working with Giorgio, you know, mm. um, I mean, we learned so much, and I could say, oh, I need a piece of orchestral music in the middle, of it. he'd go, give me 10 minutes, I, I create something, you know, and he'd just <laughs> go in and play it. You know, but he also brought a fantastic discipline 
You know, he starts at 10 o'clock in the morning. He has two black espressos. He works till five o'clock. He goes out to dinner with a beautiful woman. It was a great way of working. <laughs> <laughs> Is that all we learned from him then? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, about how to make it work. I mean, then there's, uh, there's a few gigs and there's, uh, there's kind of the gigs, there's riots at the gigs. It's, well, this is like a yeah, a lot of gigs, actually, John, much more than people thought. People thought this group, you know, because I played up the, the people that couldn't play. But what people took the idea, when I said people couldn't play, they couldn't play four years ago when we met them. They can play great now. And we actually did an awful lot of gigs. We did a whole tour right back in the early days where... Mick Jones did the sound mixing for us and we all went in the back of a Ford Transit where we just played cover versions and we went out as the hot dogs, you know, um, and, and we just played old rockabilly songs, you know, but in dub, you know, and mm. Mick was running the dub machine from the front. Um, and so we, we had really grafted really hard, you know, but obviously it became a more convenient story later when they said the group couldn't play them. We had played gigs. Mm. But we had played a lot of gigs, but again, we very much played to Malcolm's uh, format of playing low-key gigs in very obscure places that no one had ever played before. Not for us, the usual clubs or anything. You know, we wanted to play in some reggae club in Tottenham, or we wanted to play in, you know, a cinema or some little club no one had ever played before. And then we had the Embassy Club, which was like our place where we all mm. went to hang out and we played there as well. I mean, what, what kind of reactions were you getting? Would, would they be, uh, be the, the classic bemusement kind of reactions or? I mean, I, I know we were, when we did Bliss TV and I, you know, Janet Street Porter, who later, of course, I ended up going out, out with after that night, in fact, um, when we were on <laughs> Bliss. Um, the night before we played in Carlisle to three people you know, and three rather bemused looking people were sort of standing at the front going, what the fuck is this? Because again, it sounded like nothing else, you know. I mean, it very much polarized. People either absolutely loved it or absolutely hated it. But you know, the group at that time sounded massive. It had this synthesizer driving bass. It had these two drummers pounding this, out this beat. It had Martin shrieking into the dub echo machine and this, echoed shrieks and Yana putting in the Clockwork Orange soundtracks, Go Ahead Pump, Make My Day, Terminator, all these things. It was such, it was like a, a musical assault battering the audience. So <laughs> it, was, it was incredibly confrontational, the way we played. But it, very quickly, people really loved it. And then the single came out and, and it worked. It was a massive hit. It was number three in the charts. Well, I mean, it was, it was unbelievable. You have to understand that when I created or started putting this together, I never dreamt we could be bigger than the cramps or suicide. I thought it was so anarchic. I never saw it in terms of a number one group. I saw it as like a cult group. If we grazed the top 30, we'd be lucky, you know. But of course, the, it was so perfectly conceptualized, everything. Everything about the group was a story, the way we formed the group, right down to, you know, we only had six foot girls as roadies. <laughs> you know, all the roadies were a story. The way the equipment looked, it looked like some, you know, it had Japanese writing all over the equipment on the big flight cases. It looked like an invasion from Japan arriving. <laughs> you know, the video was... just so from anything else and of course it made the most incredible story and that and the album so of as course well. we, yeah yeah um, and, and we end up getting so much press you know so the single comes out and i went walked down to oxford street on the monday morning um just to sort of go to virgin records to sort of have a sneak look through the door and there was a queue around the block of people queuing up from the counter picking up two or three copies of the 12 inch record and it was unbelievable you know mm. um 
and that was when I knew I was the Messiah. <laughs> <laughs> I was a genius. <laughs> then, of course, you get carried away. <laughs> well, would you say the album's getting carried away, or? <laughs> I mean, you know, when the record's whizzing to number one. We're on 50 front covers. Magenta is in absolute overdrive. We've never known anything like it in our lives. Everyone wants to interview us because there's so much to talk about. It's like the dream group, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, add to that later on, I'm going out with Janet Street Porter and it's a sort of celeb early celebrity couple. Everything on every level works, you know. Mm. And of course, at the record company, I can do no wrong, you know. And by this time, you know, I, th I think I can walk on water or, or certainly <laughs> on the bobbing heads of drowning EMI executives, you know, <laughs> as I walk into the record company. So I go, oh, let's have adverts between the tracks. And everybody goes, genius, Tony, let's do this, let's do that. You know, and so because you think, you know, you lose all kind of control of, of that initial thing where it was this anarchic space gang that was really threatening. You know, when your record's whizzing to number one, it's such an intoxicating feeling. It's like being voted into power. You have to mandate mm. all these people with their records under their arm. So you get totally obsessively, manically carried away. <laughs> yeah, the ads between the tracks at the time was difficult for people to understand, but now, with people with YouTube is actually how people watch music all of the course, time, isn't it? Of course, and, and it was because I always said, look, that this, people would say, what's the group sound like? And I'd say, it's an action painting of 200 television sets all playing at the same time. You know, these all make great headlines, but it really did say what the group was, that it was this sounds of Russian TV or Japanese TV m movies muddled up with adverts. So the idea of the music and adverts being one unbroken stream became part of the sound of the group. Mm -hmm. In a sense, a snapshot of, of all of popular culture at the time. Yeah, and now when you look at it, I was watching that program, um, Social Dilemma last night, of what's happening with YouTube and the way adverts are pushed to people. I love this bird behind me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and... Uh, <laughs> no, that's, I just knew that line was coming. <laughs> <Are> you, <sure? laughs> um, you know, I've lost my train of thought now. <laughs> uh, about about YouTube and the way they oh, they they, they the tweet the ads. People are totally used to all that stuff. I mean, last night before we did this thing, and I was experimenting of how I could uh, present this talk. Now, I looked at a load of YouTube stuff. Amazingly. There's loads of YouTubers out there, young kids talking about Sputnik, going and showing the videos and going, I've just found this group from the 80s. This is unbelievable. This looks like it's now. But it was 30 years ago, you know, 35 years ago. And, and so somehow it did predict a future and it is relevant now. And I do think there's no other group that sounded like Sputnik then or since. Yeah, this this one thing I was going to ask about because the concept was brilliant and everything, but the backlash was so strong that in a sense uh, people overlooked the art of what it was. You know, it's it was looked on as being uh, a fancy dress raid on the charts. And there's actually quite a lot of depth and artfulness and conceptual well, brilliance to ZZ Sputnik for me, anyway. Well, that's right. I mean, people, you know, people misconstrue the irony of the fleece the world T-shirt. You know. Which, you know, as I've said before, you often overestimate the intelligence of the audience <laughs> or the press, you know, and that people didn't get the irony or maybe I just played into their hands perfectly. But here we have this group. It's number one all over Europe. You know, it's starting to happen in America. It's had this meteoric rise to fame. It's got so many ideas. It's got so many front covers. We're on every television show. I'm on Terry Wogan, for fuck's sake, you know, <laughs> doing chat shows. For one single, you know, it's all totally out of control. Then, of course, you have to top that. So when you have, it's like having a huge hit movie, you know. How do you do Batman 2 that's better than Batman 1, where it had such build-up? And suddenly I'm left with this 
fuck, you know, I've had all my great ideas. This was meant to be a cult group. We were meant to like sneak up and I was meant to spread these 50 front covers over three years, not over three weeks, you know. And then also the, the, the other thing that happened is because I, I was going out with Janet, we'd crossed over into tabloid world from the music papers, which again, Magenta was perfectly capable of dealing with. But this was a, a much scarier world than NME and Melody Maker and the kind of kid journalists. And um, there had been, you know, the violence of the record and the confrontational nature of the group had exploded into real life violence at the gigs. And someone had thrown a bottle and the drummer had got up and thrown a bottle back and it had hit some kid in the audience and he goes to court and, you know, and, you know, it's, for me, it's all dream footage, footage of Ray. <laughs> leading to court and the person said hey, he's got counts of violence and things you know because I'm living out the sort of pistols fantasy um, and then next thing I, I you know I wake up and I'm on the front cover of the news of the world the horror of the Sputnik maniac you know because as the editor at the time said you know look it was a slow Sunday we didn't have another splash the Sputnik photos look fantastic we thought oh, we'll go with that let's just build it up you know this hit it same way as they did with the pistols when it exploded onto the front cover after grumble so suddenly we're on the front cover of the news of the world the japanese people cancel the tour of japan because suddenly the group's about violence and then we get caught in a, a tabloid war between the daily mirror and the sun and john blake um has the uh, the daily mirror and piers morgan has the sun the two rival pop columns. And the Sun wanted us to ride into Wapping on the back of a tank with Samantha Fox <laughs> to break the strike at Wapping, you know, which I said, look, we, we can't do that. Um, and so we had a problem that Magenta was doing a very careful juggling job between the two major tabloids. But suddenly one of them turned against us. And went, well, okay, but well, if you're not going to give us the access and you've given the sun access because Gary Bushel's on the road with you, we're going to write bad stuff about you, you know. And because equally, as much as it makes a great story positive, the bad stuff makes a great story as well. So we get caught in this tabloid war. So we play a gig in London that's sold out that you can't get a ticket for. And the Daily Mirror run a story saying, the tout said it was the worst night of my life. We couldn't give away the tickets. They played to a half empty hall. Because they just make the shit up. You know, <laughs> you think, oh, well, it's, you know, all good press. What the fuck, you know. But it really does damage you. You know, and, and mm -hmm. playing in the tabloid game is a much, much harder game. It's actually much easier to be in The Guardian than The Times. I remember I met um, Rupert Murdoch of all people at a party once. And he said to me, you know, Tony, it's much harder to sell five million copies of The Sun than it is to sell The Sunday Times. To be populist is the hardest job in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and I've never really forgotten that. Wise words from someone. <laughs> I love the impression. Um, and, um, you know, so we really get caught in the crossfire. Um, things are getting cancelled because they think the group's going to be violent and there's going to be trouble at the gigs you know we had this drama where um uh two girls came up to me at one of the gigs and said um they said uh um we're going to kill margaret thatcher and um but if if you give us ten thousand pounds we'll give you the film rights because we're going to film it as killing <laughs> margaret thatcher. and i thought oh, oh come on you know, why don't we just go back to my hotel room, the two of you, and we'll discuss it. You can leave the boots on, it'll be great, you know, like you do. But, um, you know, it was a mad time. And, and and the next day I was just saying, oh, it was so weird last night. These girls came up to me and said they were going to kill Margaret Thatcher. And he went, I'm calling the police. And I went, oh, don't do that. You know, he went, no, it's serious. You know, next thing, we arrive at the next gig. There are 10 special branch men waiting in my hotel room. Right, and they follow us for the rest of the tour. So it looked like we've got this really heavy security all around the kids. <laughs> Special branch looking for the girls. You know, I mean, it just exploded into madness all over Europe as well. 
you know, there was crazy times. But, you know, the most intoxicating roller coaster ride you can imagine. Everything you dream about being in. You want to be in a Rolling Stones when they're on the front cover of the News of the World or a Pistols. It's, it was the most exciting, intoxicating time, John. So when the album came out, it's, I mean, I still did, it did pretty well. It didn't get to number one, but it's still, it was still a big record. Yeah, and then yeah. The whole thing, yeah, and because yeah. of all, or because because of all the problems and everything piling up, it just, and I know there's there's more stuff down the line, but it seemed incredibly compressed. It seemed even the Pistols' career, which is a short career, but you seem to compress it from from a year in the limelight into about two months. That's right. <laughs> it's like this rocket ship. It took five years to put together, and from January to August, it was virtually over. You know, suddenly, you know, I was we were playing in Ibiza. And I get a call from uh, the EMI saying, um, you know, and they're thinking the second record's going to go straight to number one and going, the record's stalling. It's almost, it was so great. It was so much about it. There, it was so much to read about it. People couldn't get enough. And then suddenly you just go, next? You know, <laughs> um, I've seen all that now. Now what have you got? You know, so mm. we were left with this. We were like, come in two seconds and there was no <laughs> second time around although there was there was there was later attempt to to make it work well yeah i mean on this on the second album i was frankly already in trouble in that how could i possibly top all those brilliant genius ideas you know mm. it was so much it was so great we still felt really confident but i could see the group was turning into a pop group rather than this anarchic gang from you know from Mad Max and, you know when I look at the video for success and here we are larking around like pop stars in Marbella in the sunshine you know wearing our swimming trucks I think <laughs> what the fuck was I thinking you know <laughs> um, you know Magenta had, had moved on to work with Janet in television doing Network 7 so I didn't have Magenta laying in bed with me at four in the morning you know i didn't have a manager either which when i look back at it it was madness not to have a manager um you know but i thought i could do everything i thought it was sexy that we controlled our own destiny it would make us keep our feet on the ground but when you look back because you think one person can't do all this stuff mm -hmm. so we were in trouble by that second record you know, it become too pop starry. And the trouble is with fame and success, you know, when you start, you go, oh, we don't know that, you know, thing. But I tell you, it's a very, very intoxicating drug and you do want more of it. So you think, well, okay, we need to, you know, how do we have a hit um, when people have seen the, the other tracks already? And we had this song called Success. And I don't know, in one of those mad evenings, I thought I'd be an ironic joke as much as like the Fleece of the World t-shirt. I thought oh, I'll get Stock Aiken and Waterman to produce it. That'll be great. You know, Stock Aiken and <laughs> Waterman could see that sort of a publicity campaign. Um, and we went into this and Pete came over and listened to the track and went, yeah, it's a hit. We're, we'll do it. You know, and he took the cassette away and um, he phoned me up two weeks later and went, it's great, Tone. Come and listen to the record. It's done. And I went, <laughs> We haven't been in the studio yet. What do you mean? He goes, well, we don't work like that. We made the record already. You can just come in and put a few bits on the top. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> and then unfolded, which I have all this on film, um, unfolded this ridiculous six or seven week drama where we literally decamped to Stock Aitken and War. And we were at war with Stock Aitken and Waterman. We'd do a version of the track in the day and we'd wait for them to go home and then we'd get the engineer and we'd do our own version. You know, um, what came out was unfortunately a light where instead of Donna Summer with Mark Boland playing guitar, it was too much dead or alive, I think, you know, so it was, it was not right. But, you know, who was, who was I going to look to, you know, no one went, well, Tony, what the fuck are you thinking? Why do you want to work with Stock Aiken and Waterman? And I probably would have gone, yeah, you're right. Fucking hell. Anyway, I've got this other idea because I was having a thousand ideas a minute. You know, but there was... I, I, I get the concept though. I think it actually conceptually, yeah, it is a perfect massive. idea. Yeah. yeah, you know, it would have been a massive hit. Everyone would have said genius. <laughs> well, I, like, like you say, Dead Alive, it worked perfectly for Pete Burns. Absolutely, absolutely. The one mm. record. <laughs> 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 That's the 
It actually sounded good as well, though, as part great of this record. one's been a hit. Really? Yeah. Yeah. So I guess, I guess with something like ZZ Sputnik, it does make sense that it's got inbuilt obsolescence. It's of, it's of a moment, isn't it? It's a snapshot of a time. It's not something that you can have 35 years of it going on and on and on, is it? No, no. Well, because it was, it was so conceptual. It was so about movies. I mean, whether it could have gone on and if we'd written more songs that would have been... I, it's just impossible to know. Um, John, you know, as I say, when I look back at it, it was the most exciting roller coaster ride, and I wouldn't change anything. You know, maybe I just I would have got, uh, you know, the people from Iron Maiden wanted to manage us, and you know, they probably would have turned us into a huge touring massive group. You know, because for those conceptual ideas, it would have sold a lot of T-shirts. But I mean, you know, I have no regrets on any of it. Mm -hmm. Whatever happened to the group. Is a perfect place to end. I have no regrets. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm, honestly, John, you know, and when I look back at it, I look back at it incredibly fondly. I think all the people in the group played their part. You know, I've said in interviews recently, if I had looked at them as human beings rather than actors in the movie, um, maybe things would have been different. But I don't know. You put together this monster, you know, and when it explodes in your face, Nothing you can do about it. But wow, what an exciting explosion Zig Zig Sputnik was. It was exciting. It was exciting from the outside watching it and listening to it. And the record actually stands the test of time, which is the thing that, that everybody wrote about everything apart from the music. But now when you actually listen to the record, it's a great record. It's extraordinary. Definitely. No one else is doing that. There's no one else like that, you know. Mm -hmm. And you talk to Marilyn Manson or different other major groups and they all go, this was a massive record. You know, you talk to Bobby Gillespie, it was a huge influence, you know, because it was extraordinary. The, the, the amount of ideas, I love the way he's smoking now. Look, the smoke behind <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like, it's like you've, your head's caught fire because of the ideas. <laughs> um, you know, it, re it really did have so many brilliant ideas. And I think, it, uh, I think it's been extraordinarily influential on everyone. I mean, you know what, I could talk forever on this group because I'm still very fond of it. You know, as we all said, history will prove us right. One of our last... <laughs> and, yeah. uh, now, now we've all lived long enough to become history. <laughs> absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, that's, that's the end of the interview, but just uh, what are you up to at the moment anyway? You just, uh, you just take it well, easy these days or you... Uh... I mean, people will say, what are you doing? You know, or, or and people will say, any chance of reforming, the, reforming Sputnik? And I will say, you know what? As soon as technology lets me be 25 again, I will be there. <laughs> <laughs> you might regret saying that. <laughs> what, a better, what a better way of spending your youth, I can't think. You know. So, I mean, I, you know, I love doing that. It was of its time when we were young and sexy, you know. Um, I mean, as you know, I've been doing the Generation Sex thing a couple of years ago. Um, we were meant to play Glastonbury this year. It was all booked. We were going to do a couple of nights at Hammersmith and, wow. you know... Or we were going to play all over, but obviously we can't do anything, you know. So, uh, right. who, so, so who knows? Steve, Steve Jones is actually going to get on a plane. He was going to get on a plane. It was all booked. Yeah, wow, he was, must he must be into the project. <laughs> we, you know what, John? We, we didn't need to do it for the money. We just did it for the sheer enjoyment of playing those great songs, you know. Mm. And Steve and Paul are really nice people to work with. Mm. Uh, you know, mm. I get on so well with Steve Jones. You know, we spent hours walking around New York together. You know, we played a few gigs in the States. It was just the most brilliant fun. Everyone was professional. Everyone knew their parts. And how great I get to play those Sex Pistols songs. You know, mm. so we were going to do a tour. Will we do it in the future? Who knows? I mean, you know, it was a moment oh. in time that was great. I hope but so. I, I, wa I watched it on YouTube and it was fantastic. No, yeah. I mean, when the, the New York gig was even better because we played a lot of the bollocks tracks in New York. In, in LA, we only played the uh, rock and roll swindle tracks, but we played God Save the Queen and all the other ones. And, you know, Geldof and John McEnroe came bounding backstage after the gig and went, you've got to, in that way he does it, you've got <laughs> to do more gigs. This was fucking <laughs> You've got to play or be the biggest punk band in the world. Yeah. <laughs> Let's not forget you're doing Generation X songs as well. And, you? Well, obviously, and to play yeah. my own tracks and me and yeah. Billy, you know, and I looked over and I thought, fuck me, it's Billy Idol and Steve Jones. <laughs> <laughs> fucking great, being brilliant. And they were all brilliant, you know. It's, 
Paul Cook, fantastic drummer. So it was a perfect unit that just absolutely knitted together after a week's rehearsal. It sounded brilliant, you know. So who knows? But you know what? I'm just looking back on a long career. I've been really lucky having been in Generation X, played with Johnny Thunders, you know, played with Spartnik, did the Sisters of Mercy, did 10 years with Mick again with Carbon Silicon, which was, again, was great fun. You know, we've been really fortunate to have had a most great career. And I'm, so people say, what are you doing now? I go, I'm really enjoying life. Yeah. The, the only thing that's to do now is get, get Mick back out playing. Well, yeah, you know, he has his demons. <laughs> <laughs> God bless him. <laughs> yeah.